Hello, this is Daniel Table Print and Play, and today we're going to look at ways to mix your print and play content with existing commercially printed board games, and I'm going to take a minute to talk to you about the best game in the world. Now, over the last year or so, there's been a rise in board game publishers such as Asmodee, Stonemaier, Asmodee, Game Right, Asmodee, City of Games, and Asmodee generously advertising their games by providing print and play add ons and bonuses, and occasionally even full games to make and print at home, which is great. Even long term print and play stalwart Buttonshy has got a boost in attention from a video review from grumpy Brit board gamers Sit Up and Shut Down. A lot more people are now asking what was already one of the most common questions in the world of print and play, which is how do I make my print and play bits feel like real board game parts? And uh, leaving aside the ontological part of that question, it's not unreasonable to ask how you can make your print and play expansion fit in with the rest of the game. So, you know, feel the same as you're dealing out cards, etc., as the rest of the commercial game that you're playing with. Unfortunately, a lot of the time the answer is that you can't. Not really. But you don't need to either a lot of the time if you're making you know player boards or stand-ups or tokens or dice or game boards even it doesn't matter if the thing that you've made matches the original game perfectly you just need to make something that works you can print out that ticket to ride stay at home board on plain paper and you can stick it together with tape and you can still play a fun game of ticket to ride on it or you know we you know I might have done a video a little while ago on making game boards that you could follow to do a much nicer job or one on tokens, for that matter. Uh, two on tokens, actually. Uh, one on dice. Yeah, if you care. The sticking point a lot of the time is, let's be honest, cards. I've I'm, My first print and play tutorial video was how to make playing cards. And um, all I can really tell you, I've been refining my print and play card making technique for years and changing it and trying new things. And it's just impossible to make cards that look and feel and shuffle and play the same as commercial playing cards at home. Um, you can make some really nice playing cards, you can make some cards that do shuffle well and do play well and deal out and everything and have a, the right amount of slide, but they're going to be thicker than the ones you get in the game box from Fancy Flight or whomever. Um, and that's just, you know, it's a limitation of making them at home. Commercial playing cards have a combination of stiffness, elasticity, thickness, thinness, and, and smoothness, which is basically impossible to replicate at home with normal person equipment. And, uh, and anyone who tells you otherwise is a liar. You can get close one way or another. You can make some nice cards, but you can't replicate exactly that thing unless you want to spend a lot of money trying. Um, and if you're going to spend a lot of money trying, why not just go to somewhere like drive through or make playing cards and have them do it for you? So instead, let's look at mitigating this as much as possible. And that brings us to the best game in the world, which also has some print and play content available for it. So uh, what is the best game in the world, first of all? Um, obviously it's a bit of subjective measure, so you know, what can we do? Uh, let's look at the, uh, the mass user aggregated ratings on popular board game website BoardGameGeek and uh, see what they think the best game in the world is. So um, let's see... Uh Yeah, of course, it's Netrunner. Why is Netrunner the best game in the world? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but most of all, the, the reason I like it in particular is it is a game about information security, fundamentally, which is actually based mechanically on information security. It does it, it has the best thematic integration of pretty much any game I've played. One player is a mega corporation with secret projects on the go, and they win if they manage to complete so many of their projects, which are known as agendas, um, while the other player is a hacker who wants to discover the details of these projects so they can you know, expose the corp to the public or sell the details to a competitor or you know, learn some cool new stuff for themselves, whatever. The corp scores if they can install their projects in uh, carelessly internet-connected servers protected by security software known as ICE and advance them enough times to complete them. The hacker scores if they can breach those servers and steal the agendas. There's two particularly cool things about Netrunner which set it apart from a lot of other games um, and this provides that thematic integration also makes it a, a very tense game of basically bluffing. You can't play Netrunner without a good bluff. Um, one of them is that all of the corpse cards when they're installed, when they're played to the table, they're installed face down. So only the corpse knows what they are. The runner has to decide whether it's worth trying to breach that server. They could spend valuable resources and find that it's just some you know, boring side project the corpse has or they might find that it's a trap that hurts them. 
or it might actually be a, a valuable agenda that scores them points and wins them the game. Um, and the other thing is that the runner doesn't just get to hack into those installed servers. Uh, oh no, they get to hack into the corpse hand. They get to hack into the corpse draw deck, which is their you know, represents their research and development department, bringing new ideas into the hand. Uh, they get to hack into the corpse discard pile if they want to, and this is relevant because the corpse, if they discard cards which they weren't forced to, they go face down. So again, the runner doesn't know what they are. There are literally no safe places really for the corpse to hide their agendas. They have to keep moving. They have to keep playing them out trying to advance them, trying to bluff things that are on agendas, waste the runner's money, um, and vice versa. The, the runner has to keep probing anywhere and everywhere and try and work out where the corpy is actually trying to hide these things. Uh, it leads to uh, an amazing game of bluff and timing and judgment and back and forth and just a little bit, just a tiny bit of luck. Sadly, Netrunner has been out of print for a few years now and there's talk of people buying and selling complete card collections for literally thousands. So it feels like it's not the best time to get into the game. Luckily it still is. Literally every day is the best day to get into Netrunner. The game has continued to exist in fan supported form with the trademarks filed off and completely new Patreon funded artwork from Lise, a group of volunteers who have been doing a sterling job of keeping the torch alight for Netrunner with as much of an official nod from the previous publisher as a board game publisher can really give to such an effort, and have just recently released their System and Gateway product, an introductory set for the game which is the new perfect place to jump into the best game ever. In reality, it's probably actually a better starting point than FFG ever provided, as there's no artificial card scarcity, and there's a nice three-step introduction to the game with decent sample decks to learn, and rather than the old approach of just basically dropping you in the deck building deep end from the word go, Thing is, I actually own a small number of Netrunner cards already, and since Nisei have gone out of their way to continue compatibility with the fancy flight printed version of the game, I'd kind of like to mix print and play cards in with my commercially printed collection. It's tempting to assume that if I just put all my print and play cards into sleeves, then that'll make them indistinguishable from all the rest, and that'll be fine. And, you know, maybe for most games that would be enough. Certainly try it first, it's, a, it's the easiest option. Um, and that is really what I'm going to do, but Netrunner is a little bit demanding in this regard. Um, a lot of the game comes down to hidden information. Is this face down a card an agenda or a trap? Which of the five cards in the corpse hand should I choose to examine? Does the runner have a sure gamble in hand right now? Do I even want to draw the top card of my deck? Any information you might get without actually looking at the face of the card could ruin the game, quite literally. Here's an example. I've taken a Nisei card that I made using my usual method, and a fancy flight card, and sleeve them both up. Same sleeves, but you know, you don't have to pay very much attention to see the difference in height between the, the Nisei card and the Fancy Flight one. And if I flex them then it's even more obvious, so if I, if I take both cards here and I apply about the same amount of pressure to both of them, you can see one of them bends a lot more easily than the other one. And they feel different, you know, if you're, if you're holding them in your hand and just shuffling them around, they don't feel like they're the same kind of card because they're not. Uh, this is fine if you want to make the, the Nisei content and just play with it on its own, but if you want to mix them in with uh, an existing game, if you want to mix your cards for the Nisei system gateway in with your existing fancy Flight Netrunner cards, or if you want to, you know, make extra route cards for your Ticket to Ride and mix them in with your existing cards in sleeves, then you need to not be able to tell which one's which. So what I need to do is try out various different substrates and see how they feel. I've got a selection of different kinds of cardstock and paper and various different adhesives here to try and I'm just going to put them together in different combinations and see how they feel. With this approach I don't need to necessarily actually print up the cards, I'm just you know going to put together the different bits of paper and card and stick them in sleeves and see if I can tell the difference between those and, uh, and a commercially printed card. Um, once I've worked out which particular combination I like the best, then I can go through and, and use that combination to print up all of the cards I need. I also need to find a systematic method for checking whether I'm happy with the result. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take five sleeves. I've sleeved up four of the Fancy Flight cards, just for my spares collection. Um, and then I've got one which I'm going to put my print and play card in, or my, my mock print and play card. So here, for example, we're using the 150 GSM card on 400 GSM card using a glue stick. We'll put that in here. 
and then I'll shuffle all these together and then I'll see if I can see just from the back whether I can tell which one it is just from you know feeling the cards and immediately I'm pretty sure it's that one yes there we go so this is just too thick so if 150 GSM on 400 GSM card is too thick then odds are I can probably discard all the other ones on 400 GSM card and let's try instead say 175 GSM on 200 GSM backing using uh, Goody, which is one of these. It's basically like double-sided tape, but without the actual tape part, so it's just adhesive on a transfer sheet. What I'm looking for is a situation where I either have trouble or ideally can't tell which card is the print and play one. This is a lot harder already. So let's see. Flex. Hmm. I can probably, there we go. So it was a lot closer and you know, already probably acceptable, but let's see if we can do better. In my case, I found that some 200 GSM cardstock with a full page label stuck to one side actually produced perfectly good cards for me. They wouldn't work if they weren't in a sleeve because I can only put the printing on one side. I'm just putting a, a label on one side of the card. Uh, but since Netrunner pretty much always gets played sleeved anyway, that's no problem in this particular case. And realistically, if you're trying to fit print and play content in with your commercial board game sleeves are pretty much a must anyway. Now, you'll notice I'm taking a very specific approach here. First of all, I've printed my cards. I mean, these, this is the way that the Nisei cards arrive. There's nine up, three by three on a sheet. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to just peel just the front edge of the label away. Don't try and apply the entire label at once. That's a recipe for failure. You've got wrinkles and creases and warps and so on. So I'm just folding back the first couple of centimeters, flipping over, then I can use this, this large part of the label that isn't sticky yet that still has the backing applied to line it up nicely with the sheet, the card stock that's beneath it. And then I can just press down that leading edge smoothly. And then I can use my cork backed steel ruler to just slide along the top there. The cork won't damage the printing even though it's laser printing which can sometimes chip if you scrape it. So I'm pulling the backing out from underneath and sliding the ruler forwards at the same time to apply even firm pressure all the way along the sheet. So at no point does it twist, no point does it kink or stretch. And that should leave us with a neatly applied label that doesn't warp the paper too much and doesn't have any wrinkles in it. Rather than just cutting into strips and then cutting the strips the other way, I mean, you could do this if you have like a, a guillotine or a rotary paper trimmer, by all means use that but I find this a little bit more accurate. All my cards end up the same size, which again, for Netrunner, I'll have to be particularly careful. They can't be distinguished from each other. I'm using a hand rotary cutter because I find that the most accurate for long straight cuts. If you're not used to one, you will find you have much more luck with a simple knife. Um, something like this is great. Even a Stanley style utility knife will work. And then I'm going to cut these two interior horizontal lines first because they're the shortest ones. So it leaves the least paper unsupported while they're open. But I'm also making sure that my cut doesn't go all the way through. So I'm starting it on the page and I'm finishing it on the page. So we still have that outer border intact, hopefully all the way through. And that means that I'm not going to lose any of my crop marks. Like this, I make sure that I keep my crop marks all the way through to the last cut. It's always best to do more than one pass rather than trying to dig all the way through in one go. Firstly, you'll generally get a cleaner cut like that. But secondly, it means you're less likely to slip and damage the cards and need to reprint stuff. So there you can see I've made my cut part way through but not actually broken the border each side. 
And I do that on the two horizontal lines first because they're the short ones. And then I can come back and do the two interior vertical lines. So now this center card is free. I can lift the sheet up, slide it out from underneath. Next, I'm going to do the top and bottom horizontal cuts. Again, we're now starting to free up more cards. I want to do the shorter one first because it means less flapping around while I'm working. And if you do have the opportunity, it's always worth having the bit you want to keep underneath your ruler and the bit you don't want to keep exposed. So like that, if while you're making your cut, you do accidentally veer off, you don't ruin anything you care about. And then finally, I can make these long vertical cuts down right the way down the side of the page to free up all of the last edges. And there we go, I've now cut enough cards for your first game. It probably took me about 15 minutes. It's worth mentioning that these cards obviously are sharp cornered still. You can get tools that will trim your corners down, obviously you can you can round them off. But if you're sleeving your cards it really it's very hard to tell the difference. <laughs> Unless someone's sitting there and like fiddling with the corners of your cards as they're going through your HQ then I wouldn't worry about it to be honest, it's extra effort that you don't need to bother with. So um Welcome to Netrunner. In case you're wondering, I appreciate that this at this point looks a little bit like a Nisei advert. And you know, to an extent it is. I, I love Netrunner, it is a fantastic game and this is probably the best way to get new players into the game of Netrunner right now. Um, however, just to be clear, this is, is not a sponsored video and that's for three reasons. Firstly, I you know, honestly don't have enough views or subscribers or clout to, to get any kind of sponsorship in the first place. Uh, secondly, I'm not sure I'd want one. It's the, there's a kind of obligation that comes with being a sponsored video that I, I don't really want to have to try and fit into. And thirdly, I honestly don't think Nisei would go for it anyway. And, um, and if they did, it would be a really poor judgment on their part. It'd be a, an awful waste of money because I'd just do it for free. You know, I, had, I did do it for free. That's what you're watching right now. Now the other thing you'll need to play a game with Netrunner is some tokens. And um, actually that's almost a lie, because if you want to play the, the Nisei system of Gateway, then you don't need any special tokens. You can use drafts, or coins, or ghost stones, or rocks you found in the garden, or cubes from a Euro game, whatever. Um, they've got a setup where you know if, it, if you place the token on your ID card, then it's your money. If you place it on a face down card, it's an advancement. If you face it, place a token on a face up card, it's a virus or power token, depending on the card in question. Uh, if it's a tag, you've got a little card specific to put all your tags on, and so on. So you know you don't you don't need anything special if you don't want to. But this is a print and play channel. We're we're going to do some nice tokens. All right. A while back. I actually designed a set of tokens specifically for use with Nisei's version of the game. So you've got money, you've got your virus and power tokens, you've got link and bad pub and, uh, and brain damage there. And these are in keeping with the Nisei approach. They're entirely new art, not using any of Fancy Flight's visual assets, graphic design or anything, but you know, visually referential back to the Fancy Flight design. So they'll look at least a little bit familiar if, you've, if you're used to playing that runner already or you play against somebody who is. If you'd like a copy of these tokens yourself, then you can find links to download the files in the description to this video. Each set of tokens on the sheet is set up with a grey band between the two halves, so you can position it right on the edge of a bit of 2mm card, because that's about the same sort of thickness as the Fantasy Flight tokens. It's a good tactile thickness for tokens, I like it quite a lot. The hexagonal tokens are set up for the, the easiest way of cutting hexagonal tokens that I know of. There's little equilateral triangles between each hexagon, so you cut part way through the card for the two directions that aren't parallel to the fold. And then cut all the way through the parallel lines to make strips of tokens. And then you can just finish separating off the tokens themselves by finishing off your previous part cuts. And of course it would be easy to use the same files to make round tokens if you have a set of arch punches or similar. Uh, but hexagons are, are you know, nicely referential to the Netrunner feel. There's, there's hexagons over a lot of the cards already. It's part of the graphic design of the game. So 
So that brings us to our contest. Do you want to win the set of cards and tokens that I've just put together, which is enough for you and a friend to get into the best game ever? Or perhaps enough for you to give to a friend so that they can get themselves into the best game ever and then you have more people to play against? If not, then you might as well just stop here because there's nothing else for the rest of the video. So why is there a contest? I mean, the traditional YouTube answer is drive engagement and then they'll do something like this and, you know, I'm... Sod engagement, really. Um, I just like Netrunner and I'd like to encourage more people to play Netrunner because the more people are playing Netrunner, the more chance I have of getting a game. Um, but I'd like there to be like a proper challenge because otherwise, you know, if you just write, right, Netrunner is cool in the comments below. I mean, you can, you can do that if you want, don't get me wrong, by all means, uh, it is cool. But there's no deserving winner there, you know, it's just a random luck of the draw thing. Um, so I'd like to come up with some kind of challenge, but the problem there is that there's really going to be two different types of people watching this video. And there's one of them is perspective mark. I mean, um, people who've not played Rant Runner before might be persuaded to be interested, but aren't already a player. And the, the other type is veterans of the scene who know all about the game, who know all about Nisei already, already have seen the system gateway release, and um, they just watch this far in the video for a laugh. So here's the challenge. Write in the comments below, or email me at jake at diningtablepnp.com what is the best way to get new players into the game of Netrunner? <clears throat> Whether that's the best way to persuade somebody to try the game for the first time, the best way to persuade somebody that now is the the best time to buy into the card pool, which, you know, let's be let's face it, is probably the cheapest that it's ever been. Um, whether it's the best way to teach your first game. If you're a hardened veteran, you can tell me a good tactic to drag new players into the game kicking and screaming. And if you're not, if you've never played before, then you can just tell me what would work for you. What would persuade you right now to get into the game of Netrunner? Uh, you know, one try is normally all it takes. You have trouble forgetting the best game in the world. I'm going to give this a month from the day this video is uploaded. Then I'll pick my favourite and contact that person to get an address to send the cards and tokens to. I'll possibly regret this when I see the postage price, but this is open to anyone anywhere in the world. I'll send it from the UK, I'll pay for the postage, any import duties or taxes are up to you. And to be clear, the winner is my personal favourite entry, I'm not doing a random draw or anything, my judgement is final. That's it for this one, have fun making cards to fit into your favourite games, and you know, give Netrun a try if you haven't already, it's really worth it. Cheers. Hello, this is Dining Table Printer. Really failing on basics here. Yeah. Grumpy Brit board game reviewers sit down and. No, I almost said it correctly, that's no good.